All right, uh, welcome back for another two hours of torture. We're going to talk about government and how government operates in the United States as far as sports go. Now, uh, let me just go through quickly about how the sports structure is here in the United States for professional sports. I won't get into college sports, so I'm just going to talk about professional sports on this one. Uh, there are four major leagues in America. There's Baseball, Major League Baseball, National Football League, National Basketball Association, National Hockey League. The Major League Soccer is trying to emulate all of those leagues, and I'll explain how they're trying to emulate all those leagues as we go on. Basically, sports in this country has changed over the last 50 years, partly because of Congress, partly because of court actions, partly because of technology. In 1922, Major League Baseball received an antitrust exemption from the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court, in its ruling, and this goes back to the Federal League, which existed in 1914-1915, Federal League folded. The Baltimore franchise in the Federal League wasn't happy with the settlement that Major League Baseball or the American League and the National League was going to give them sued. And they sued because they wanted to get into Major League Baseball, they wanted money, all kind of things. And the Supreme Court of the United States in 1922 ruled that baseball, while an interstate business, was just a game. 19, in uh, 2007, 85 years later, according to the Supreme Court, baseball is just a game. But we all know that's wrong. This is basically how sports works in this country on the major league level. And uh, how many of you have heard of David Sturm, the commissioner of the NBA? Because I'm going to do a lot of name dropping now, because these are people who I've encountered throughout my career. David Sturm is the commissioner of the National Basketball Association. And about 15 years ago, I went out with him one afternoon, and he said, I'm going to explain this to you. I said, fine. So I'm going to explain how all of this works. So this is coming to you from one of the geniuses of sports, David Sturm, commissioner of the NBA. And if I were you, I'd take notes, because this is worth taking notes about. So everybody get your pen and paper. In the United States, to be a successful league, to be a successful sports franchise on the major league level, you have to have three things. Now, usually, this was all American. And I'll ask the Americans, what do you think, where are the Americans? Just raise your hand. What do you think the three things are? All right, what do you think the most important thing is? Anyway. To have a successful league or team. Um, I guess it's the right name. Um, what? Wrong, 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 wrong. <coughs> See, I usually get, I usually have like 60, and you know, there's one who usually gets it, and the rest of them look at him and say, come you're so smart. There are three things. You need government support. And when I talk, what do you think when I say government support? Now, this is from David Stern, and it's followed by everybody. It's followed by Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner. It's followed by Don Garber, the Major League Soccer commissioner, by Gary Bettman, National Hockey League commissioner, even Bud Selig, Major League Baseball commissioner. Why is government so important? They can do the business and check it down. Okay, that's part of it. I'll, 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 yeah. Yeah. You, the first, the most important thing, and he's got it right, is that the government builds the facilities for most teams. Now, it, and it's changed a little bit in the last couple of years, and I'm going to get into that change. Initially, starting in 1950, the city of Milwaukee was looking for a Major League Baseball team. The city of Milwaukee decided 
Their stadium, which had a minor league team, was antiquated, but they felt they had what it took to run a major league team. They felt that they had the population. And I'll talk about population a little later, because in 1950, all you needed was a population and fans. Remember I discussed this morning, they don't go after fans anymore, right? Go after customers. They want fans. So, but it's changed in the last 57 years. So Milwaukee decides we want a Major League Baseball team. What's the best way of doing, of getting a Major League Baseball team? If you, have, you, wanna, if you think you have the answer, just shout it out. What's the best way of getting a Major League Baseball team? Build a venue. Build a venue. So all of a sudden, the City Council of Milwaukee and the Milwaukee Mayor said, you know what? We're going to build a baseball stadium, and we're going to go get a Major League team. They built the stadium, and they got the Major League team in 1953. In March of 1953, they persuaded the Boston Braves ownership, which was led by Lou Perini, to Milwaukee. Lou Perini, in his last year in Boston, drew 300,000 people. He drew 1.9 million people in Milwaukee in 1953, and they had a windfall. They started the ball rolling. They built the first municipal stadium that was built expressly for a major league team, and they got it. And that started the domino effect. Other cities did not start building facilities quite yet, but building facilities is a big thing. What, what is another, and I'll get back to facility building in a minute. Also, what else does government do? I said, you got mm -hmm. one. You got mm -hmm. one. What? Maybe budget? No. Well, but, well that's part for of For my country, facility. budget. I yeah, well, that's part of know. building facilities. Yeah. yeah. What are the other two? Security. Media. Security. Media. Media. Security. No, security is no big deal. Media. What kind of media? Cable TV. In the United States, cable TV is not regulated. It's been deregulated since 1994, which means cable uh, networks and cable operators can work in basically a monopoly situation where you bundle all the cable stations together and you sell it as a package on basic expanded. What sports owners did was go into partnerships with cable networks like ESPN, like regional sports networks. It used to be here in this area, it was home sports entertainment way back when. It's probably Fox something or other now. But back in the 1980s, it was home sports entertainment. And what that does is that the teams sell the rights to distribute games to the cable operators. Cable operators pay a lot more money because they're able to get fees from subscribers and they're able to get fees from advertisers. Whereas an over-the-air TV station, depending on ratings, you don't need ratings on cable, has to get big ratings to get advertising to support, build, uh, support sports on TV. The only one that does that in the United States is the National Football League. So you need government and you need Congress to continue cable TV as is in this country so that teams can milk consumers for money. Uh, by the way, I'm going to go around the room. I'll ask the Americans this, the five Americans. How many people on average watch SportsCenter? How many? Uh -huh. like, no, how many people do you think? ESPN has 92.5 million home subscribers. How many? 92.5 million, million five, five subscribers. Times my population. How many watch it? In my country, it's like 28 million. How many watch <laughs> Sports Center on average? The average evening Sports Center? 83%. That's <laughs> all. He says 83%. <laughs> How about 800,000 people? 800,000 people. The biggest ratings on ESPN, aside from the NFL package they have now, was the Alamo, Bowl, uh, Alamo Dome Bowl a few years ago. They got 5.2 million people watching. The NBA on ESPN averages about a million viewers. So, government has it set up where ESPN can collect $3 a month from 92.5 million people, which roughly comes out to about $300 million a month, which means that ESPN, before they open the doors, 
on an annual basis gets about um, $3.6 billion a year. I uh, know, uh, $300 million. Yeah, about, yeah, about, yeah, about that. Yes. And they would not get that if <laughs> cable TV was allowed to practice free, it was allowed free market practices where the market would dictate how many people buy it. So ESPN is able to throw around money to everybody because government refuses to deal with cable TV. By the way, what would happen to sports in the United States if Congress re-regulated cable TV? <laughs> I'll give you the Americans, and you guys who are the Americans, because we're talking about a lot of money here, you guys who are the Americans, listen to their answers. What would happen if the government decided to go in there, regulate TV, and allow people to choose what they want instead of being told what they want when they want cable TV? What if it's a la carte and you have the right to choose what TV stations you want to buy? Because Congress is talking about that right now. How many people do you think would really pay to what buy ESPN? Or other sports networks? They know the answer. They don't, they're scared of the answer. The answer would be about 6%. And for those in the United States who know of Howard Stern, who went from over-the-air uh, radio to satellite radio, the buy rate was abysmal. People will watch sports if it's given to them for nothing. People will listen to Howard Stern if it's given to them for nothing. But if you want to sell it to a mass audience, and remember, they're going after consumer customers now, not fans, not going after broad base. So ESPN would probably shrink from 92.5 million to probably about, because they do have the NFL package, maybe 8 million subscribers. And they know it. They absolutely know it. Because the honest truth is, is that the hardcore sports fan in the United States is about 8% of the population. Probably about 24 million people. Probably about 24 million. And those are the hard numbers. And Disney is up at Capitol Hill. And Disney is basically, through their lobbyists, telling Congress and telling the United States, don't even think. Don't even think of re-regulating cable TV. It would kill us. One fifth of Disney's profits comes from ESPN. You remember, Disney is a multi, multi-layered company that has theme parks, puts out movies, owns TV networks. But one-fifth of, e of Disney's profit comes from ESPN. The Yankee Network, which I talked about this morning in New York, the original network, may be up for sale for $3.2 billion. Because they got 7, 8 million subscribers. But the truth of the matter is, if it was on an a la carte basis, based on what the Yankees get in TV audiences every night. And the Yankees do about 2% of the audience. So think about 2% of about 7 million people. That's probably what the Yankees would end up getting. Now what would happen is that if ESPN wants to continue to have their high revenues, they would have to charge $17 to $18 a month instead of the $3 a month that they charge right now. So government's very important as the number two pillar. What's the number three pillar of the three, three legs of the stool that David Stern's talking about? Yes and no. Probably no. Not at number three. Anybody else? I gave you government and media. Government and media. What's number three? What? The What? The players. No. Nope. Message. Nope. Customers. Customers, but actually it's corporates. It's corporations. It's corporate dollars. That's why when you said sponsorship, I kind of hemmed and hawed. What is corporate? 
corporate is the guys who buy the luxury boxes, the guys who buy the club seats, people like McDonald's, people like Coca-Cola, all the other sponsors, because they get rolled into buying the, you know, you buy sponsorship, they'll give you X amount of seats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you talk about corporations in the United States and the corporate seats, because of the tax laws in the United States, the corporates can write off 50% of the expense of the seats. So they're paying half the amount of money that you would pay for. Say, you're paying uh, $250,000 for a luxury box, well, you could write off $125,000 of it. So when you look at how sports operates in the United States, if you're going to be successful, you need three things. You need government, you need local media, and you need corporates. If, you, if nothing else you take out of this speech to take home, those are the three most important things that you need to run a franchise. And comes other things, marketing partners, et cetera, et cetera. And somewhere down there is um, fans, somewhere. But, you know, that's, that's in, it's inconsequential. You need those three. Before you go to the fans, you need those three. Now, I'm going to give you an example of how things work and how things don't work. Major League Baseball had a tremendous year last year. They set all kinds of records in terms of revenues. They got new TV contracts from ESPN, from Turner Sports, and from Fox. Two of the three entities there are cable, and they get most of the playoffs now, the baseball playoffs, which is the crown jewel of the baseball season. So they had a tremendous year in terms of that. They had a tremendous year in terms of getting new baseball stadiums. New York is getting two, Washington, Minneapolis, Kansas City is upgrading theirs. And of course the corporates keep buying and buying tickets. Every time you look, Major League Baseball is setting a new one day attendance mark. Partially because the corporates are going out and buying the tickets to give away to their clients so they can have a day out or do business. The Florida Marlins baseball team, how many people are familiar with the Florida Marlins baseball team? This is how the business of sports doesn't work. Florida Marlins baseball team won the World Series in 1997, I guess it was 2003, 2003, and then they got rid of all their players. Florida does not have its own baseball park. It shares it with the Miami Dolphins and Wayne Hazenga, who's the owner. Now, Florida is kind of a dodgy situation. It got into Major League Baseball on kind of a fluke in Miami. They really didn't do too many studies of the market. Baseball in 1991 was pressured by Congress to expand, where they might lose the antitrust exemption that was given to them in 1922. And, and you've got to connect the dots. You've got to trust me here and start connecting dots to see why the Florida Marlins franchise is not a good franchise to own. Baseball said, oh yeah, Florida, that's, that's good market. Spring training, Miami is good, you know, South Beach is now being built up. Because that was the days of Miami Vice on the TV show, and that brought people back to Miami or South Beach. So I said, yeah, that sounds good. And it's also the gateway to Latin America. Because there are a lot of Cubans who live in the area, and a lot of people from Latin America. Venezuelans are now moving to the Miami area. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So they're moving to the Miami area. So the Latin, the Latin American community likes baseball. We've got to put a team down there. They did one marketing survey. The Yankees played the Baltimore Orioles at the football stadium, it drew 60,000 people. And baseball said, wow, see, we've got 60,000 people. Let's give Wayne Hazenga the franchise. And by the way, Hazenga also owns Blockbuster Video. Well, we could have synergy because we could put out our videos of baseball as part of the deal with Hazenga, and we could get all our videos into Blockbuster, and we can make more money because people rent our videos through Blockbuster. They go down to Miami. Hazenga buys the stadium from the state of Joe Robbie, who owned it. Joe Robbie put up the stadium for the Miami Dolphins, built it into a baseball configuration. Now, this is where it gets kind of strange. Hazenga buys the local cable TV station. He also owns the building. 
and he sets up the Florida Marlins as a separate business from his holdings. He has the Florida Marlins baseball team, he owns the TV network, he owns the stadium, he owns the concessions, he owns the parking. So he's getting all the money from the concessions, he's getting all the money for parking. It's a lot of money, concessions and parking, to get. He says after 1997, after the Florida Marlins won the World Series, I got to break up the team because the Marlins are losing money. The media in this country bought the line that I can't afford the Marlins without looking at what was going on with the Marlins. Pazanga owned the stadium. He got 100% of the revenues that was spent in the stadium. He owned the TV network. He got 100% of the revenues from Marlin Games into his pocket. The Marlins themselves were losing money because he wasn't putting the money from the revenues from the TV or the stadium into the team, which is why he showed a loss. He sold the stadium, he sold the team to John Henry, but he kept the concessions from the parking, he kept the concessions from the concession stands. He kept the TV money and gave some of the TV money to John Henry, who then lobbied to get a new stadium built in Florida, the government, uh, in Tallahassee. And Jeb Bush, the son of George Bush, whose library who you're sitting in, said, no, I don't want to spend money on a baseball stadium in Miami. Henry ended up swapping franchises and ended up with the Boston Red Sox. Jeffrey Lurie, who was in Montreal and could not get a stadium in Montreal, ended up with the Florida Marlins in the swap. Jeffrey Lurie went to Jeb Bush and said, I need a baseball stadium. And Jeb Bush again said, no. So the Marlins get good enough to win the World's Championship in 2003. The money for the players is due. Lurie decides, that's it, cutting ties. I'm trading all my best players away because I'm not getting the revenues I need. They are still fighting for a baseball stadium in Miami, Dade County. They are still looking for somebody in the government, whether it's the city of Miami, Dade County, or Tallahassee. There's a new governor who used to be the, um, Charlie Crist, who used to be the lawyer for minor league baseball. But even Charlie Chris couldn't get the legislature to get off the dime this year and fund the baseball stadium in Miami. So the Florida Marlins are doomed to mediocrity, and they could be in a cycle where they're good for a year or two, because they're playing in a stadium that's owned by somebody else who keeps the concessions, all the concession money, and they also have a TV contract with the original owner who's making because they do get money from baseball's revenue sharing plan. So all of a sudden you have a situation in Florida where the baseball team cannot compete because they don't have a new stadium. You can't, so you have to have government behind you in that case. In other cases, the Boston Red Sox are not getting a new stadium, but they're getting government help and tax breaks and tax incentives to build around Fenway Park, to buy the land around Fenway Park, and to build businesses. And they're also using Fenway Park for other, they own Fenway Park. You could cater a party there now. You could do all kinds of things as they're looking to raise all kinds of revenues. So you get the concept that without government, you're dead? Anybody want to comment on that? Anybody have any comments on how in the United States you need Local government support, first and foremost. Anybody want to comment on that? How about my Cub fan, fan friend? Why you need local government? Yeah. Cubs needed it to get lights. Yeah. And, and lights bring in an extra $500,000 a night for the Chicago Cubs. But at the same time, we're the, we have the least amount of night games. Yeah, because you're, you're limited. But a night game in Chicago for the Chicago Cubs baseball team, Playing a game at night, and they had to get government approval to play a game at night, means $500,000 paycheck. $500,000 more a night when they play night games. It's worth $9 million a year for the Chicago Cubs by playing night games. So do you understand the concept of how government has become partners with teams?
in the United States. So you understand that to get a new stadium now. That now the Baltimore Orioles had a new stadium in 1990. The Baltimore Orioles management was bad. So just because you get a new stadium doesn't mean you're going to be good. You better have the right people in place to make the right decisions for you to get the best players on the field, whether you develop them through development leagues or if you go out like the New York Yankees do and pay for six-year free agents. So you understand that without government, you're nothing. So you need the government support. How many of you... Uh, this again with the Americans, so, you know, the non-Americans, you know the most popular sport in the, the, the sport in the United States that makes the most money is football, right? Yeah. So that's what you've been told. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the Americans, and we talked about this at lunch. You think the NFL had a solid business plan to become the NFL? No, they had no business plan. That was a whole bunch of luck what happened to the NFL. But the NFL, not only did they get lucky, they needed government support. And, and this goes back to 1957. And it goes to, into baseball. And the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers decided to move to the West Coast. Walter O'Malley took the Dodgers from Brooklyn to L.A. Horace Stoneham went from New York to San Francisco. And Horace Stoneham and this is part of the story that's never been told. He got a million dollars uh, from a local guy. I forgot the guy's name right now, but he was a forerunner of uh, Matty Fox. The guy's name was Matty Fox, F-O-X, Matty Fox. And he came up with something called SpectreVision, which was an early kind of cable TV network that Matty Fox was hoping to develop and using the San Francisco Giants as his guinea pig. Never got off the ground, but Stoney got the million dollars guaranteed for moving out to San Francisco. But after the Giants and Dodgers moved, Branch Rickey, who you might have heard of, he was the guy who signed Jackie Robinson ending racial discrimination in Major League Baseball, was basically thrown out of baseball by the Pittsburgh Pirates, and he was looking for something else to get involved in. And he came up with this idea of the Continental Baseball League, which was supposed to put teams in New York, in Houston, in Toronto, in Denver, in Minneapolis, and other places. That never got off the ground. But some of the business plan did, and some of it was eventually co-opted by the National Football League. And the number one thing that was co-opted by the National Football League came through the American Football League. Now, I, I spoke this morning briefly about the Los Angeles Rams and how their games were on TV in 1951, their home games, and they lost attendance. The NFL teams in those days all had their own individual networks. Washington, New York Giants, Cleveland, Chicago Bears, Los Angeles Rams, etc., etc. The Continental Baseball League decided if they were going to be an 8 or 10 or 12 team entity, they were going to sell themselves and they couldn't do this legally. It was, it was against antitrust laws in the United States. But they were going to sell themselves as a single entity to a TV network with all teams sharing equally in the revenues. Does that sound familiar from the NFL? Have you heard about that with the NFL? How NFL teams to this day still share revenues 32 different ways? So you've heard about that. This comes out of the Continental Basket, uh, Baseball League. Continental Baseball League folded in 1960, never got off the ground. The American Football League was being formed, and apparently Ricky sent out his proposal to Lamar Hunt, who owned the Dallas Texans of the American Football League, or was about ready to own the Dallas Texans of the new American Football League. Hunt put together his league charter, and in the league charter it had all teams would share revenues from television equally which means if you put a team in New York, it would get the same money as a team in some much smaller, like Denver was very small in those days. New York and Denver would get the same amount of TV money, as opposed to forming their own networks. AFL starts in 1960. It gets a TV contract with the American Broadcasting Company, even though they were violating antitrust laws, but they got around it because ABC in those days was only two-thirds of the TV network. It was not a full-time TV network. 
So they were able to sell themselves as an eight team individual, eight teams, one league, to TV. Pete Rozelle is the commissioner of the National Football League. He's 33 years old at the time, and he's in his first year as the commissioner of the NFL. NFL had some very distinct markets. There was New York, which was the biggest market, Chicago in those days number two, Los Angeles number three, and they had Green Bay, which had about 28,000 people in those days, and there was no TV market. Pete Rozelle, looking at the American Football League, said, hey, wait a minute. They're sharing TV revenues equally. We can make more money as a single entity selling our product to TV than we can if we sell it individually. He had to sell his league on it. But before he had to sell his league on it, he had to go to Congress. Congress called Roselle in front of them and said, why do you need to sell yourself as a single entity? This is an important thing, actually. Roselle convinced Emanuel Seller, who was then the uh, House Judiciary Committee head, that the NFL needed the money and they felt that they needed to even out the money among the teams in their league. Green Bay getting the same money as the New York Giants. Green Bay getting the same money as the Chicago Bears. On September 30th, 1961, that may be the biggest date in NFL history. Now you're going to say, what happened on September 30th, 1961? Nobody's going to get it in this room. You could have a shot in the dark in it, but nobody's going to get it. It's one of the biggest days in sports history in the United States. Anybody want to even hazard a guess? What's the what you want to date again? September 30th, 1961. Um. Either the, uh, they developed a plan for the Super Bowl or had something to do with TV and Monday Night Football. Or no, Martin. well, it has something to do with TV. Uh, John Kennedy, President Kennedy, signed the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961 into being. And what that basically did was give Pete Rozelle the opportunity to sell all 14 of his teams as one single entity in place CBS, there were two networks in those days that could really afford it, CBS off against NBC. And that was what projected the NFL into where it is today. Also gave the same protection to Major League Baseball and subsequently would give the same protection to the National Basketball Association, which only had eight teams at the time, and the National Hockey League, which only had four teams at the time. But two of the, uh, six teams at the time, but two of those teams were located in Toronto and Montreal, in Canada. That's the date that changed the NFL significantly. Because Pete Rozelle was able to go out and start talking and playing CBI, CBS off against NBC. AFL was locked into their contract that they signed in 1960, which when they were very grateful to sign in 1960. They were locked into the contract until 1964. So Congress basically gave the National Football League an antitrust, uh, basically gave them antitrust protection. Not the same as in baseball, but limited antitrust protection, which helped them in terms of TV money. And the TV contracts just went out of sight after that. You know, now they're over, you know, $18 billion for the 32 teams over an eight-year period. So which, what you have is that Congress basically set the foundation for the explosive growth of football. Congress would play another role with football. And it, before I get into the, the next role with Congress in football, in 1964, Roselle played CBS off against NBC for the uh, 1965 and 1966 TV rights. CBS won the bid, but NBC wasn't too happy. At that point, the New York Jets owner was Sonny Werblin. Sonny Werblin had been the publicity agent for a lot of stars, including Elizabeth Taylor. And he became very good friends with Robert Sarnoff over the years. Sarnoff was the head of NBC. Sarnoff was really upset that Bill Paley at CBS got the NFL rights for 1965 and 66. So Sarnoff called Sonny Worldland in a fit of anger and said, Sonny, 
what did the NFL get on their TV rights from CBS? He said, uh, he gave them the number. It's like $32 million over five years. He said, you guys have it now. Just come into my office, sign. That made the American Football League. That was made football what it is today. In 1966, on June 8, 1966, Congress approved the merger of the National Football League and the, oh no, June 8, 1966, the merger of the National Football League and the American Football League was announced. It's a good political story in this one, really good political story in this one. Pete Rozelle, commissioner of the NFL, is when you're a sports commissioner in the United States, you are also a chief lobbyist. And part of your job is to lobby Capitol Hill. You have to lobby the Senate. You have to lobby the House. Pete Rozelle was told by his owners, we want this because we think we can make money. And if we continue having this bidding war for players, we're going to lose money. Of course, they always say that. So they told Rozelle, listen. This is what you've got to do. You have to go to Congress, and you have to get this merger approved. This is how the politics of sports business is played, and it's played to the fullest. Roselle gives Russell Long a call. Russell Long was the Senate majority, uh, was Senate majority leader at that time, Democrat from Louisiana. And Roselle says, uh, Senator Long, how are you? Look, I've got to talk to you about something. We want to do this merger. We need this merger from the American Football League and National Football League to present our, prevent ourselves from going into financial ruin. And then we'd lose teams, and they'd lose teams. And football wouldn't be as good in the United States if you don't allow this merger to go on. And Russell Long says to Roselle, well, let me think about it. He says, what does this do for me? We don't have a team in New Orleans. We were supposed to have a team in New Orleans, and that's another story which I'm not going to get into that involves Jim Crow laws, and, and, and that's for another day, that story. He says, uh, listen, uh, Commissioner, with all due respect, I don't know if I could vote for this because it really doesn't do anything for my constituency here in Louisiana. And Rosell says, well, I appreciate that. And he said, can we talk further about this? And he says, uh, all right, you know, and let me know what's going on, and let me know if we can do anything with New Orleans. And he says, well, I don't know if we can do anything with New Orleans. You know, they just expanded to Miami. That's the ninth team. We just went to Atlanta. It's the 15th team. There's not enough talent for more football teams. But if anything changes, I'll let you know. So Roselle hangs up. The next call he makes is Hale Boggs. Hale Boggs was a powerful Democrat out of Louisiana. And he says to Hal, he says, uh, listen, uh, Congressman Box, can we have your support? We really need your support. We want to get this merger thing done. And uh, Congress needs to approve this merger because you've got to give us an antitrust exemption. So Hal Box had already talked to Russell Long. And he said, uh, well, you know, I don't see where this is any good for my constituents in Louisiana. I just don't see it. It doesn't make any sense. You know, there's no team in New Orleans. And Roselle, and then he says to Roselle, is there any chance that New Orleans would get a team? And Roselle says, well, I doubt it, but let me make a few phone calls and I'll get back to you. About three days later, he calls back uh, Hal Boggs. He said, I think we could do something in New Orleans. And Boggs said, then I think we could do the merger. Calls Russell Law. He says, uh, I think we could do something in New Orleans. Russell Long says, I think we could do something with the merger. They put on the Interstate Transportation Bill, which is the bill that did, gave final money to finish off all the interstates in the United States, a rider, National Football League, American Football League merger. They passed the bill. The House did, Senate did, Signed into law by Lyndon Johnson, the president. Ten days later, the announcement New Orleans was going to have a National Football League team starting in 1967. And that's the story of the New Orleans Saints, Congress, 
and the American Football League National Football League merger. So you don't think that uh, politics plays a big part, the government plays a big part in sports? Any reaction to that story? You must have some reaction. How about you know, people from you know, non-Americans? What do you think of that kind of story? I just wanted to comment. Uh, it's, it's pretty common that, go uh, that government supports sports in Russia. Yeah. It's pretty common. Yeah. Uh, for us, it's, it's usual. So yeah. that's, why, that's why we don't. <laughs> but you have a, a hockey league now in Russia that allegedly is not government controlled. But almost yeah. all clubs, the uh, pro clubs, yeah. They uh, do get financial support yeah. from the government. Yeah. Yeah. And Olympic champions, they get lots of money from government. Yeah. But that's how our government works. <coughs> that's exactly how the government works. How about other people from other countries? Yes. Actually, in my country, governments, they focus on um, football. They don't really want to you know, spend money on other sports. They want to focus on football because they believe that is where you know, our players. How about others? In addition to uh, Nigeria and um, government still to support sports, but one of the things that um, most um, private and I don't like is that if they support sports, they want to be having the law of that sport. So there's a debate now like that. If you use those support and leave uh, mm -hmm. the law aspect of it. But yet, I don't think that the government also support and also stick to the law that is what they want, which I don't think. That's my football story, I have a baseball story. I got stories. I can tell you these stories day and night. And I do to people. Major League Baseball, getting back to Milwaukee. Milwaukee starts the ball rolling in the United States by building a baseball park. In the 1950s, Boston moves to Milwaukee. Philadelphia moves to Kansas City. St. Louis moves to Baltimore in the stadium that was built by the city in Baltimore, but not necessarily for baseball. The Dodgers move out to LA. The Giants move out to San Francisco. Politicians are getting involved. The Continental League sounds like a good thing. And they go before Congress and they call on the baseball people and say, how are you going to incorporate the Continental League into the structure of organized baseball, which is what it was called in those days, organized baseball. Nobody seemed to have the answer. Uh, but it was a good thing that the Continental League was going to start because they were going to put teams in all these cities. Well, all of a sudden the backlash starts from Congress. If Major League Baseball doesn't do anything, they're going to basically blow their antitrust exemption. The Continental League folds before it plays any games by August of 1960. In October of 1960, the National League of Baseball says, okay, New York has been punished enough for losing the teams. And they were punishing New York because Robert Moses wouldn't build a stadium for Walter O'Malley and the Dodgers. So yeah, we're going back to New York and we're going to have an expansion team in 1962 and we're also going to go into Houston. Almost everybody was happy except for Cal Griffin, who owned the Washington Senators baseball team. And they were always awful, and they couldn't draw people. So Cal Griffith decided to move his team to Minneapolis, taking his baseball team out of the government seat of the United States, Washington, D.C., and that causes a big problem because the congressmen used to get free tickets to Washington Senator games. All of a sudden, there's the possibility that there's no Washington Senators in 1961. All of a sudden, the American League, which really wanted to go into Los Angeles, has a problem. No team in Washington, and that's a problem for baseball because they'll hear about it from Congress. So very quickly, baseball decides to expand for the 1961 season. They allow the Senators to move to Minnesota. They put an expansion team into Washington for 61, and they lost all the good players that eventually would be part of the uh, Minnesota Twins American League Championship. 1965, and they put a team in Los Angeles. Congress is happy, Washington has a team again, New York has a team, they're off their back. In 1967, Charles Finley decides to move the Kansas City, Roy uh, Kansas City A's 
to Oakland. And all of a sudden, guess who's knocking at the door again? After Finley moves his team from Kansas City to Oakland. The U.S. Congress. And they basically tell Major League Baseball, you know, Finley was a rat. He was an awful owner and people got turned off in Kansas City. However, Kansas City is a baseball city and we deserve a team and we want a team almost immediately. Baseball's response was, nah, we're not going to expand. We may not expand to 1971 or 72. Stuart Symington, who's a Democrat, was a major, major player in Washington in those days. He was a senator from Missouri. And he basically told Major League Baseball, look, here's the deal. You guys don't live under the normal business practice laws of every other company in America. You have an antitrust exemption. You like your antitrust exemption. I don't know if I'm going to continue allowing you to have that antitrust exemption unless you put a team in Kansas City. Well, you know, the National League is looking around saying, we're not expanding until 1971. American League says, we really don't want to expand. Symington says, well, I don't really want to keep letting you have the antitrust exemption. Make a long story short, guess who had a baseball team by 1969? Kansas City. That forced a couple things. Kansas City needed a partner. They went to Seattle. Seattle didn't really have a baseball stadium ready for the pilots. And they also chose the wrong owners to run the pilots. Meanwhile, the National League, reacting to the American League, decided to go into either Montreal or Buffalo, depending who had the stadium in San Diego. San Diego is in, Montreal is in, Seattle is in, Kansas City is in. But there's a problem almost immediately. Seattle, if you ever read the best book ever written on baseball, the best, is, and because he's a friend of mine, I shouldn't say that, is Jim Bounton's ball fork. And I tell every sports business management group I speak to to get the book ball for. It's 1969 season, but everything you want to know about the business of sports and laugh through it and just plug in contemporary names, stories haven't changed, is in that book. It is just the funniest baseball book going. It's also the best sports book ever written. Who is it by? Jim Bounton. He pitched for the Yankees from 62 to 68 and uh, hilarious stories in there, but also the stories about how the players were getting shafted by owners. But we're not talking about players being shafted by owners. Ball four. You read Ball four? Great book, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Really funny book. Great book. And it's still relevant, even though it's 38 years old. It's still relevant. Anyway, the book, Ball four, takes place with the Seattle Pilots. The Pilots go out of business after 1969. They go bankrupt. And Bud Selig, remember Bud? Remember Bud Selig? He's looking for a team in Milwaukee. He walks into bankruptcy court and takes the Seattle Pilots out. Moves them to Milwaukee in March of 1970. Seattle is going ahead building a dome stadium under the pretense that they're going to have a Major League Baseball team, because they didn't have a football team at that time. They're going ahead and building the stadium. Seattle decides, well, you know what? We don't have a team anymore. What are we going to do? We think the team was taken away from us wrongly. They decide to file a lawsuit going after baseball's antitrust exemption. As the stadium gets closer and closer to completion, the kingdom in Seattle, NFL, at this point, decides to expand to Seattle and to Tampa. Not because the NFL wanted to expand to Seattle and Tampa. They did it because the World Football League was in existence, and they wanted to take away two markets that the World Football League might have taken, the two best markets out there. So they decided to clip off the WFL. So <coughs> Seattle all of a sudden has an NFL team. They go after Major League Baseball. Guess who got a baseball team by 1977 after the threat of antitrust exemption is taken away? Seattle. Seattle, Seattle gets its team. Toronto also gets its team. So again, you're talking about government, and you're talking about how government is pushing and pushing and pushing baseball 
any other sports in this country to expect. Basically, mo mostly baseball and a little football. Now, I told you about the Florida Marlins and how they started in 1993. Do you know why there's a Florida Marlins baseball team? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Florida Marlins baseball team because of two people. Colorado Senator Timothy Worth and Florida Senator Connie Mack III. And around 19, and, and I was around in those days, and I interviewed these guys, and I talked to these guys, and they were after specifically a baseball team in Denver and a baseball team either in Tampa, Florida, or, or Miami. And basically, they put the screws to baseball, Worth and Connie Mack III. And they basically said, listen, this is the deal. You guys have been going on strike. You guys are a labor mess because baseball had struck in 72, there was a problem in 76, there was a problem in 80, there was the big strike in 1981, there was a minor strike in 1985. You guys are screwing up your business. You guys would be much better off running your business as a business without the antitrust exemption. And I'll tell you what, we'll make it easy for you to run your business without an antitrust exemption. All you have to do is not put a team in Denver or not put a team in uh, either Miami or Tampa. So Congress all of a sudden is getting on the backs of these people. In 1990, there was the baseball spring lockout. Yeah, do you want to answer? Yeah. Yeah. They call it. Yeah. We're doing a conference right now? Red <laughs> okay, wrong room. Yeah, I that. See, I could do that too. That's what you get in New York. You should get all kind of, you know, in New York, when there's a the wrong number, you're supposed to answer it in a snappy way so you never call back. <laughs> it's like telemarkers used to call me at 6 30 at night and they, they would say, Oh, I'm sorry. I would say, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm eating dinner. But if you give me your number, I'll call you back while you're eating. Good <laughs> one. <laughs> I'm, I'm a wise ass from New York, so what did I tell you? But anyway, anyway, in 1990, Congress couldn't do anything because baseball was in the, in the middle of a miserable lockout, so they laid off baseball until they cleared up their house. But they came back after baseball se settled its labor dispute and said, look, you don't have any excuse now. You either expand or we take the antitrust exemption away. So all of a sudden, guess who had teams by 1993? Denver and Miami. Pressure. Phoenix area. The Phoenix area. All of a sudden, Mayacopa County decides it wants a baseball team. Mayacopa County. We're going to put a baseball team somewhere in Phoenix. And the, uh, the idea was in Phoenix that we're going to put an arena in, which they did for the Phoenix Suns, and we'll put a baseball stadium in, and we'll build a downtown. But of course, there was really no downtown in Phoenix. Still, after all these years, there's no downtown in Phoenix. They put a measure up there, and basically they said in 1994, we'll fund the stadium, but the funding runs out for the stadium on March 1st, 1995. If there is no team put into Phoenix by March 31st, 1995, we're not going to build the stadium. Meanwhile, Frank uh, Masani, is suing Major League Baseball in Tampa. Poor old Frank bought the Minnesota Twins, the Oakland A's, Texas Rangers, San Francisco Giants, Seattle Mariners, and basically wanted to move them to Tampa or St. Petersburg. And basically, baseball found local ownership in all those places. So Frank decides he's going to sue Major League Baseball, along with Mike Piazza's father, Vince Piazza, because they wanted a team in Tampa, and they were going to sue on antitrust basis. So all of a sudden, acting commissioner Bud Selig has a problem on his hands. He's got this Tampa thing, and he's got this thing that's going to run out in Phoenix on March 31st, 1995. So how do you think he solved his problems? The Tampa Bay Devil Rays and the Arizona Diamondbacks, and they reached an out-of-court settlement with Morsani and Piazza. Yes. Well, okay, with those two teams afterwards, like just for marketability, why has the Diamondbacks been able to be decent while Tampa Bay continues to struggle? Um, management, basically. They picked the right guys to run the team. Whereas, 
I could get into that, but I won't get into it because it'd just bore everybody. But if you want to ask afterwards, I could tell you the whole saga of that franchise. So I'm not going to get into it. But anyway, so that's how baseball in the United States, Major League Baseball, has evolved. It hasn't evolved because the owners have said, no, it'd be really good to put another team in this area or put a team in that area. They have been pressured by governments, and they, whether it's local government, whether it's federal government, uh, whether it's just the, gov the local people in terms of voting on a tax increase for a stadium, they've been pressured. A lot of pressure has been put on them. A lot of pressure has been put on the NFL. Now, I talked about the NFL briefly. And I touched upon 1974. 1974, the World Football League started, and the NFL decided to expand. But it wasn't because Congress told them to expand. They expanded because they decided to try to lop off their opposition in the World Football League in denying them two markets, which they deemed as the best non-NFL markets at the time, Seattle and also Tampa. The NFL did expand out of the goodness of its heart in 1993. Well, it wasn't the goodness of their heart. They got $140 million from Jacksonville, and one of the original bidders for the Jacksonville team was Jeb Bush, but he dropped out. So we could have that tangentially introduced into this because we are at the George Bush Library. Uh, but anyway, Jacksonville came in, Charlotte came in, they paid $140 million each, there were 28 teams in the NFL at that point. So do the math. $280 million to get into the club, 28 owners. To get into the fraternity, each owner took $10 million as a thank you from the people in Charlotte and the people in Jacksonville and went into the league. At that point, the stadium games really got kicked up in the NFL. Houston moved to Nashville. Cleveland Browns moved to Baltimore. The Raiders moved from L.A. to Oakland. The Rams moved from L.A. to St. Louis. But it was the Cleveland Browns that caused the most trouble for the NFL. Cleveland sold out every game. And even though Art Modell had the contract to run Cleveland Stadium, it was a rundown place. And they decided to build a basketball hockey arena, a baseball stadium, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. And old Art Modell was told, well, maybe one day you'll get a stadium. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail about Cleveland and their finances. However, I will tell you this. How many of you have ever got to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is subsidized by the federal government now. They cannot break even on just admissions. Federal government is now subsidizing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame like they do sports teams. Anyway, Modell moves to Baltimore. Cleveland decides to sue. And there's no antitrust really, there's not really that much available to NFL owners in or to get back at the NFL because they're not going to undo the merger and they're not going to undo the Sports Broadcast Act. But Cleveland decides to sue anyway because Cleveland was selling 80,000 tickets a game and they were a tr tremendous TV market for the NFL. Kevin White is the mayor of Cleveland. He's leading the lawsuit and eventually the NFL decides, you know what, we have just gotten done with the Players Association, their lawsuit against us. We lost the USFL-NFL trial back in 1986. That leaves us vulnerable to antitrust laws. So we'll cut a deal. And they basically cut a deal. Cleveland was going to build a new stadium. And guess what? Guess who had an NFL team by 1999? Cleveland. Now, the last expansion team that the NFL went into is another study of politics and sports in the United States. When Cleveland was added, it became 31 teams, and the NFL decided to become totally symmetrical, have 16 teams in each conference and four teams per division. So they were going to expand for the 2002 season, and basically they wanted to expand to Los Angeles. Houston was the, their fallback. They weren't really looking to go back to Houston, but they would go back to Houston if L.A. somehow screwed up, and L.A. screwed up big time. This is how the politics of sports is played. There are a whole bunch of groups looking for a football team in L.A., one led by somebody you might have heard of, Michael Ovitz. He's a celebrity agent, and he was partners 
um, with uh, Disney at one point until he was fired. And uh, he owns creative artist agencies. And he was going to put a football team in Carson, California on the toxic waste dump which needed $50 million to be capped and cleaned up. Don't laugh, that's where the LA Galaxy now plays, on that toxic waste dump in Los Angeles. See, Beckham could get a disease. <laughs> Make him a lot better, you know, better known. Hey, Beckham has got radiation disease. <laughs> By the way, they play at the Home Depot Center, so I guess they could get the materials to clean up from the home. Well, that's another story. So anyway. LA, it's LA's franchise to lose. So Ovitz has got this idea, we're going to put this thing in Carson City, and Tom Cruise is going to be one of the owners because he was an Ovitz client, and we're going to get these other people, and we're going to have Hollywood's trendiest people as the owner of our team in Carson on the toxic waste dump. Meanwhile, LA, the LA Coliseum Commission has this old building, which was built for the 1932 Olympics, which sits there and it's the home of USC, and they want a team, and they're going to put in the Coliseum. Coliseum is not up to NFL standards. Los Angeles has no money. I mean, I don't know how many of you have been to Los Angeles lately, but there's no public money, because there's a lot of problems in LA, awful lot of problems in LA. And there's no money from California, because California is broke. And the only reason they're not broke right now is because Arnie uh, got people to vote on uh, referendum that basically loaned them money, took out bonds, so the next financial crisis in California won't be until 2013. And Arnie will be safely gone from the governor's office at that point. LA wants the team. The governor is Gray Davis. He can't do anything. Los Angeles mayor, he can't do anything. Nobody has the money. Meanwhile, Houston is putting together a solid presentation they get money from Texas and, and Harris County, and Robert McNair would be one of their owners, and he's going to put up some money. And they don't want Houston. They want Los Angeles. They want Ovitz. They want Tom Cruise. They want all these guys as owners. They want LA. It's the second biggest market in the country. They ended up with Houston because California was broke. And it's, broke, it's a broken system in California right now. The government does not want to put up any money for any teams right now. Whether it's Sacramento, whether it's Oakland or Fremont, California, whether it's Anaheim, they're not putting up any money. They don't have it. I mean, California has 50 million people. They have huge budgets and they have huge budget deficits. California is still playing the stadium game. Last year, Sacramento voters voted 72 to 28 and 80 to 20 in two separate votes against building a new arena for the owners of the Sacramento Kings, the Maloof brothers. This is a deal that is inexplicable when you look at this deal, how the Maloofs walked away from it, which is why they got trounced. This is how the business of sports operates, if you want to take notes on this one. Last year, the Sacramento Kings ownership group got into negotiations with Sacramento County. Sacramento County decided, we'll put up $500 million. We'll build a new arena. We will build it. We'll give you all the revenues. We want, we're desperate. We're really desperate. We want to keep this team here because it's the only national identity that we have besides from Governor you-know-who, Arnold. And Arnold doesn't hang out here in Sacramento. He hangs out in Palisades Park. Pacific's Palisades, rather. So, why don't we... You know what? This is what we're going to do. We'll build you the arena. You keep all the revenues in the arena. We'll put it up to a vote. We will go out there and we will push it as long as you push it. Well, the Maloof brothers look at it and say, hmm, yeah, we like the arena concept, but there's a problem with this. You're talking about putting up a little village around the arena of businesses and all. We have 8,000 parking spots right now at the arena we play in now. Now think of it. We have 8,000 parking spots. We charge $10 a night for parking. So we get $80,000 from just parking. Multiply that by 41, and we get $3 million a year for doing nothing but having a parking lot for cars. 
you're telling us you'll build this place for us, but you're not going to give us parking. That's the deal breaker. They're getting everything out of the arena. They're going to get all the luxury box money. They're going to get all the club seats money, all the concessions money, everything from Kings basketball to the minor league hockey team that they're thinking of putting in there to concerts to Disney on Ice and all the other stuff that you have in an arena. They would get all the revenue, and whoever goes in there would get you know whatever they get for the night. But the Maloofs tend would make money. The deal was broken because they would lose the $3.2 million from the parking lot, and then they have their own arena, which has similar things. They would lose all the parking money. That was the deal breaker. That was the absolute deal breaker. And Sacramento voters voted 72-28, 80-20 against the two proposals for the arena. But guess what happened about three weeks later? After the public said 80-20 and 72-28, they went back into negotiations to build an arena for the Sacramento Kings, and this time they weren't going to put it up for a vote. And right now they're negotiating, trying to get a deal done, trying to spend $500 million in taxpayers' money to keep the Maloof brothers happy in Sacramento. Even though the voters basically told them, 72-28, 80-20, don't bother, we don't want to pay taxes. We don't want to pay a tax increase. Uh, Greg, Dan Rasher actually worked for the city on that proposal. That's an aside for him. But he, was, he did the economic forecast for Sacramento. Just wanted to let you know. But uh, so anyway, so they're talking. They're absolutely talking. Now, how many of you are following the NBA referee scandal? Is that shaking, is that shaking your confidence in the NBA? It depends on who's the only one at first one. No. Nope. No. That's not gonna, the, the money people have decided it's no big deal. Three days after the story broke in the New York Post, which is a newspaper of dubious distinction at best, uh, Orlando City Council had a shot at basically making a statement and saying that, you know what, we're repulsed by what's going on in the NBA. But instead, the Orlando City Council said, let's spend $1.1 billion on building a basketball arena, forming arts center, and renovating the Citrus Bowl. Four days later, the Orange County Commissioners gave their final approval. The voters never had a shot. The hotel operators never had a shot, even though they said they could use that money for better things than an arena, performing arts center, and a renovation of the Citrus Bowl. Orlando is building a stadium, or is actually building an arena. Think of it, $1.1 billion. Think of what you could do with $1.1 billion for a community. <laughs> Rich DeVos is one of the richest people in the world. He's the owner of the Orlando Magic. He could easily build his own arena, but why would he build? I mean, I'm going to throw this question out to you because we're talking about the government. Why would any owner, knowing that arenas are money losers, and arenas are money losers in the lifespan of an arena now is about 14 to 18 years. If you were an owner, would you want to build an arena privately? No. This is a trick question. I'm just warning you. Well, this is, depending on the deal, I would say you take the, the deal. However, the arenas now are being built where instead of, the, Orlando's one of the few places where now the municipality is actually putting up money for the arena. Instead, they're giving them land. And Jerry Jones is getting half his funding from Arlington. They raise taxes 1%. So uh, all of a sudden, Owners are now given this prospect. We can build you an arena, but we'll take revenues out of it. Or you can build your own arena. We'll give you the land, like they're doing in Fremont, California, or trying to do in Fremont, California with the Oakland A's. They're doing this with the New York Giants and Jets, they're doing this with the New York Mets, doing this with the New York Yankees. Here's city-owned property. We'll build the infrastructure for $300 million. You put the stadium up. 
We'll create a special tax district where we'll collect taxes, but you don't have to give it to us. You can give it back to yourself. This is the new paradigm now, how you go about building an arena. Orlando is kind of odd because the city is actually putting up money. Now, the owner says, okay, yeah, that's great. I'll build the stadium, like in Fremont, and I'll build condominiums in the stadium facing home plate, and I'll build a row of stores, and I'll build a Hall of Fame, and I'll build this, and uh, what about property taxes? Now, let me ask you a question about property taxes. Do you think all that building, all the building that's being constructed, that you should be paying property taxes on that building, on the construction? What do you think? I'm going around the room. This is a very simple question. If you build a house, do you have to pay property taxes? Yes. yes. They're building their house, which is a stadium. Should they be paying property taxes? Yes. yes. Well, they don't. They have come up with two different schemes. In East Rutherford, New Jersey, the New York Giants and New York Jets are building a new football stadium, which will be open in 2010. And basically, the city of East Rutherford is saying that property is worth about 12 to $13 million a year in taxes, what they plan to do there with the stadium, putting a Hall of Fame in, putting businesses in, et cetera, et cetera. But the state of New Jersey, which was so desperate to keep the Jets in New Jersey and keep the Giants from thinking of moving to New York, the Jets and Giants would move to New York, they were so desperate, they said, you know what? There's this program called Pilot, which is, called, which is payment in lieu of taxes. And you qualify for that, although they really don't, but you qualify for that. So, you know what? Why don't you just give us an annual payment of $2 million a year and We'll call it even. And the mayor of East Rutherford, New Jersey, went epileptic. He said, wait a minute. And there's a lawsuit right now between the city of East Rutherford, New Jersey, and the state of New Jersey, which cut the deal, saying that East Rutherford should be paid $13 million a year, and they're only getting $2 million a year. But if you think that's bad, think of this one. You guys are going to New York in a few in a few weeks. How many of you, other, other than how many of you, been to New York? How many of you gone to Madison Square Garden? Okay. You, why don't you explain where Madison Square Garden is instead of me? Just explain the area. If where where are you from? I'm from Texas. From Texas. You're from New York. Okay. I'll, I'll explain. Madison Square Garden sits at the edge of the Garment District, which you won't see on your trip, but it's down 7th Avenue. And CNN was across the street from it, and it takes up a, a two-block square. It goes from 33rd Street to 31st Street, uninterrupted, from 7th Avenue to 8th Avenue. It's a very prime piece of Manhattan real estate. How much do you think they pay in property taxes every year? None. None. Nothing. Zero. Zero. What would they They would pay probably about $17 million a year. And this is a government deal that was cut in 1982 by Ed Koch and you carry. And basically, the New York Knicks were threatening to move to Long Island. And the New York Rangers were threatening to move to New Jersey. The Knicks were going to, from four miles from Wall Street to suburban Uniondale, New York and the New York Rangers would go across the Hudson River because, get this, the New York Knicks, because of the structure of property taxes, couldn't afford to pay for the best players they could get in the NBA. And they would have to move because the deal was awful. So New York, Ed Koch, in a state of, uh, in a fit, saying, we can't let this happen, and the state saying, we can't let this happen, decided, well, you know what? Yeah, if we take the property tax exemption away from Madison Square Garden, or if we take them away from paying property taxes, and it's only eight, nine million dollars a year, what's the big deal? <laughs> so they decided to take the property tax costs away, yes. Does this happen everywhere? Everywhere. New York everywhere. <laughs> Go back to Arlington and see how much property taxes the Texas Rangers are paying. And check out the special tax district that was built part of the stadium, and then you'll say, what? 
Anyway, the Knicks stayed in New York. The Rangers stayed in New York. They don't pay property taxes, nor do they pay their utility bills. Because Con Ed, because they claim that the utility bills were hurting them so much, they don't pay utility bills. I'm paying their utility bill. Me and all the other Con Ed, eight, uh, the nine million other Con Ed consumers are paying Madison Square Garden's electric bills. <laughs> what is the garden worth now? $1.2 billion with the TV network? Probably more. And they're not paying property taxes. Yes? Government are supposed to provide um, infrastructure, so yeah. amenities to, to the people and citizens. Yeah. And I, so when you are talking about tax in, in um, property, so if government to build uh, um, maybe a project, a lot of projects for the citizens, yeah. the country, are they expect, do you expect the citizens to pay tax for that project they build for, for the citizens? They expect citizens to pick up the bills. That uh, you, you, where, where are you from in Texas? But no, we, we are expected to pay for sports here through our taxes, through all kinds of taxes. Whether it's sales tax, here's a, here's a good one. Huh? When you were in Florida, a couple weeks, where'd you stay in Florida? Oh, we were all over. Oh, no. Okay. Did you take, take a look at the sales tax bill in Florida for your hotels? And you'll notice it's sky high. It's very high. And do you know why it's so high? You know why it's so high? They're paying, no, that's nothing to do with the amount. They're paying the hockey arena in Tampa, the football stadium in Tampa, the baseball stadium in St. Petersburg, the uh, college stadium upgrades, the old Miami arena, which is still up, and the white elephant, which is on the auction block, the two new arenas in Miami and also uh, in the Miami area. They're, you're paying for all the sports teams. And how many games did you see, by the way, while you were in Florida? None. None, huh? And yet you paid for all the facilities. You paid, right? Take a look at that bill. Take a look at that tax bill. You guys rent a car? You guys have any car rentals? Well, I didn't. I didn't pay for anything. <laughs> <laughs> you guys did. No, we yeah. 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 got another one. Who's the daddy? Okay. I, got a, I got another story. Get that on tape. In fact, I, I, I got. Yeah, well, I got a, yeah wait, let me just finish this story and I'll tell you this story. Nineteen. Yeah, Evan, when yeah. you finish, we got to take. They're about to. They need a break. And okay. So when you finish this one, we need a break. Yeah. Let me finish this story and now I'll get your question. 1992, I went to Seattle, and I was doing some stuff in Seattle. I had a rental car. I was looking at the rental cars, 8%. In 1998, I went to Seattle. I got a rental car. It was 18%. 18 cents in a dollar. It was a 10 cent hookup, uh, 10 cent rate height. So they more than doubled the sales tax on the rental car. And I said, why'd you do it? And they said, new baseball stadium, new football stadium in Seattle replace the kingdom, plus a new base, uh, new football field in Everett, uh, and a hockey arena in Everett, and some upgrade in Tampa and Tacoma. So I was paying, instead of eight cents on the dollar, 18 cents on the dollar, and that 10 cents difference all went to sports facilities in the Seattle area. Yes, and okay. you, this, you, I you get right. I know the reason why the government of the country would want to be interested in one particular sport. They feel that people need diversions and entertainment and sports is popular and sports you know sports spending is great i'm stay, supposed to take a break so why don't yeah, you guys yeah. take a break. Need to get a break about five minutes come back and then we'll have about we have about 20 minutes for y'all to ask questions and then the tour so you're getting into sports business management and do you understand what you're basically getting into is more than just the team? You're getting into a whole. What are you getting into? If you get, you know, if you're not in the public relations, even if you're in the public relations, okay, what are you getting into? Consumers. Consumers. Customers. 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 How about the non-Americans? What do you think how our structure is? And when you go home, and if you get into the sports business, do you, are you going to look a little differently at 
how sports is run in your country, and you're going to look to America because when I was on the ship two weeks ago, when I was giving speeches on the ship, and I ran into a woman from Liverpool who supported the Liverpool Football Club, she hated the thought of Americanization. And she said, I see it coming in. I see the luxury boxes. I see the club seats. I see the concession prices go up. I see the restaurants coming in. I see the parking increasing. Soccer, football. It's 45 minutes, 10 minute break, 45 minutes. It's compact. They're going to lengthen it out. So what do you think, Dawn, when you go back home, how the Americanization, which is creeping into Europe, creeping into China, may creep into your country. How are you going to react? For us, it's cool because we already kind of saw that. Yeah. So for us, it'll be better because, you know, we probably get a better job because we saw that. Yeah. But in general, you don't know, it's, it's more that people don't even like that. But it happens. We should work here with this. I think for us, too, in our country, it's to be cool because I've told you before, in our country, they base everything on football, football. So, so you would welcome the Americanization yeah, sure. of, of sports in Nigeria? Sure. Mm -hmm. I met my friend who's on, he should be on the computer right now. Um, I'm already working in the sport field. I mean, I'm sports manager in my soccer club. So we, uh, my club is playing in the second division. Yeah. Uh, just uh, taking notes when I, uh, when I need to get my, I mean, for my club. I'm, for example, sports scholarships and the stadium organization. I'm going to try some things. I mean, I'm planning to do I'm just to compare right now with American organizations yeah. and uh, we have already, I mean, crazy supporters in Turkey. They're really crazy. I mean, mm, but here, maybe 80,000 people came to the stadium, just 40,000 people watched the game. The other people just came to for no, Yeah, I'm going to, I, you know, I, for those, uh, you may, most of you probably heard the Yogi Bear simply because he says stupid things. <laughs> Yogi Bear. But I, I give lectures to Montclair State University in New Jersey at Yogi's place. And Yogi has a baseball museum. And I brought my wife's cousin there one day to meet Yogi. It was his birthday, 60th birthday. And he wanted to meet Yogi. So I let him meet Yogi. And he was pointing out something. You talk about 80,000 people, 40,000 people maybe not watching the game. There's a picture of a baseball game in 1955 somewhere. The Yankees are playing on the road. I think it's either Chicago or Detroit. Every face in that picture, it was a crowd shot, was pointed at the pitcher and catcher. And my cousin, my wife's cousin looked up. He said, there's something wrong with this picture. I said, why? Because they're dressed up in suits and coats. He said, no, no, no. He said, they're all concentrating on the game. He says, I go to baseball games or other games now. Half the people are just walking around like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, a quarter of the people are sitting here watching the game, and the other quarter are trying to figure out, why did they give me tickets for this tonight? <laughs> why am I here? And, and again, what does it get back to? Customers. Customers. If there was anything I taught you today, what's that? Customers. 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 Yeah, not customers. Not fans. <laughs> that and the three, three things you need for a successful franchise. How about others? Okay, uh, maybe in Indonesia, we have, uh, this, we have the government and system. Uh, we have a uh, spot for the government, and in the spot of for the government, we have a uh, spot industry, and it's good for the business of sport for the sport industry, yeah. and it can make uh, for Indonesia to be developed for the sport. And, you know, uh, from the 2000 to 2005, uh, government uh, protected for the sports and the athletes, and it's good. And when after this, uh, you know, um, me because I am from the uh, sport colleges, and I must give a record for the governments. And maybe this government can be better for the sport in Indonesia. I haven't even touched on the Olympics, and that's like a 17-hour speech I could give you, or more. <laughs> uh, but I can tell you. One thing, international pressure on the United States over the steroids issue came from the International Olympic Committee and Jacques Roger and, you know, and, and a friend of mine who's a historian, a guy by the name of Bob Friedman, who I lectured with on the ship, said to me, 
the other day, why don't you ever write a book on the International Olympic Committee and their fascination with fascists as leaders of the IOC? And why, what brings people into the International Olympic Committee to butt into another country's business? And the reason I bring that up is you probably are sick and tired of hearing about Barry Bonds and the steroids. Barry Bonds and the steroids, Barry Bonds and the steroids. Well, San Francisco Grand Jury was dealing with that. The New York Olympic Committee was looking to get the 2012 Olympics. And Jacques Roger, the head of the IOC, and some other people through back channels basically told the American Congress and John McCain that unless baseball cleaned up its act, and baseball will not be an official sanctioned sport in the Olympics in 2012, unless baseball cleaned up its act, New York would never get the Olympics. What Jacques Roger, why was he involved? He's a Belgian doctor. International Olympic Committee has its own rules. He was the one, along with Jose Canseco, but he was the one who started pushing the American Congress, along with Richard Pound, who's the head of the World Anti-Doping Administration Agency, a guy who, who uh, sometimes gets the facts right, sometimes, pushed American Congress into holding those hearings on steroids. And I found this out through back channels, and you were asking me about, you know, what do I do? And Bob Dupay, who's the number two guy in Major League Baseball, behind Bud Selig, called up my friend Andy Zimberlin, uh, Zimbalist, who's at Smith College and who's a noted sports economist. And he said, tell your friend he got it right, meaning me. And I said, Andy, what are you talking about? He said, he loved your piece about Jacques Roger, go home, get off baseball's back. So what, New York doesn't get the Olympics. And baseball could care less about the Olympics which is why there's the World Baseball Classic now. And a lot of the steroid nonsense in the United States was started by Jacques Roger. Now let me ask you something. My last question. If a guy gets caught with steroids, is it cheating or is it illegal? Both. Why does the International Olympic Committee insist on its own police force, which they did in 2006 in Italy, they begged the Italian government to let them handle steroid abuse or steroid usage and other usage. Don't get involved. We'll handle it because it's cheating. I was on the TV show in, uh, with Sam Donaldson. I know most of you probably don't know who he is. Sam Donaldson was uh, one of the guys who really badgered Richard Nixon when he was president of the United States back in the 70s and he was doing an ABC news show and I was a regular contributor on the show and we were talking about steroids in baseball and Sam said something to me he says so what would you do with steroid users and I said arrest them arrest the athletes Sam said you can't arrest the athletes can you and I said why not what makes them bigger than the average person you're picked up for steroids if they do an investigation of you, or you, or you, or you, haul you down to the police station, are you going to get special treatment? No. <laughs> Congress gave athletes special treatment. Jacques Roger was the guy who says, now I'm going to ask this my final question. Final question you get from me. Is it cheating? Or is it illegal? And should the athlete pay the price in jail, like normal citizens? or pay a price in money by sacrificing a year of his career? Both. Both. It depends on the um, yeah. Yeah. amount. The amount of steroids hit? Not steroids. Yeah. Yeah. Money. Money, not steroids. It's illegal because it's an illegal drug, so therefore yeah. you follow the law of America. Do you know who signed in the bill who signed the bill to make steroid usage in the United States illegal without prescriptions? Jacques Rocher. United States. Uh, Take a look around. George H. W. Bush. George H. W. Bush in 1991 signed the bill that made steroid possession in the United States illegal. It's illegal.
Now, the penalties aren't very stiff, but we have forgotten that steroid possession in the United States without a doctor's permission is illegal. And you hear all this stuff about, well, Bonds cheated, Bonds did them. First of all, there are allegations. There's no proof he did anything. They're all allegations. And the fact is that when you look at it realistically, Latin, there are some Latin American countries that steroid usage is not illegal. That you can pick up steroids in Mexico with no problem. No problems at all. Dominican Republic, no problems at all. Venezuela, no problem. Where? Venezuela. Venezuela, no problem at all. So you got a problem here, because in Major League Baseball, you can't take steroids in Venezuela, Dominican Republic, and Mexico. Come here, they don't catch you. You can do it. So you know we got a bunch of people who are trying to impose <coughs> rules, like Jacques Roger, who I have no use for, Richard Pound, who I have no use for. But in this country. George Bush signed the legislation in 1991, and this is where I'm ending it, making steroids illegal. So what should the bottom line be? Should it be a law enforcement issue? Or should we be asking employees to do law enforcement for us and hand out penalties? Yes? Law enforcement issues. Because these people are, are role models. No, no, my no, role models. No, 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 our role models. But Children, um, role models to children. Children look up to them. Some do. Some do. A lot of them do. Like every, if you ask any um, five-year-old child, who do you want to be like? You'll say um, Shaquille O'Neal, um, Barry Bonds, somebody. So if those same people are taking, if those people are taking drugs, steroids, why won't they? Why won't the um, kids take drugs? So, so shouldn't they be put in jail? It shouldn't be. It should be a law enforcement issue. And I've been fighting about this with people for about four or five years, saying, and going back to Donaldson, Donaldson at the end of the program looked up to me and he said, you know what, I haven't thought of it that way. You're absolutely right. It's a law enforcement issue. It should be handled by the DEA and the FBI in this country. That's who should be handling it. Bud Sealing shouldn't be handling it. Congress has given the tools for all the law enforcement officials to handle it. They had a beat on Jose Canseco. They had Mark McGuire. They knew they were doing steroids, they being the law enforcement officials, and they backed off in 1993 and 94 because they wanted to go after the distributors. And they were afraid that they hauled in Canseco or if they hauled in McGuire that they would lose the distributors. So they got protection. They got a lot of protection. Everybody has been talking about this argument about, well, he did steroids, he did steroids, but there's never, uh, but this should be the punishment. You listen to sports talk radio, and this is getting back to Mark Cuban and, and fans. You listen to fans. They hate Barry Bonds. Why do they hate Barry Bonds? We don't know. We're supposed to hate Barry Bonds. Because some newspaper writer said it, or some guy on radio said it. They don't, it's a very simplistic question. Should these people be in jail? Should they be banned from the game because they're cheaters? Are they cheaters or did they break the law? And I'll leave you with that. I want to hear your answers. I believe it depends on the law. Anyway, it's illegal in this country to possess steroids. Yeah. It's illegal. That's the law. That was signed in by George H.W. Bush. And that is the law. If you're picked up with steroids, they bring you to the police station, you get arrested. You don't say you go to jail? You can go to jail. And you don't want to go to jail. Even if I told you, maybe for me, they don't want them to go to jail. They might still continue using the drugs. Even if they ban them from the sports, they might still continue using the drugs. So it's bad for them to go to jail. Why is it bad for them to go to jail? Well, because so that they will stop using the drug and they will learn from that. And they have to I think they should be thrown in jail. I really do. I think, I think if you throw an athlete into jail, that will end all the drug problems. Yep. Yeah, sure. I think all you need is one. Yes. Yeah, the, the, there are two, two things wrong. 
First is legal, and they have to go to jail, and second is cheating, so they have to be jail. But there's cheating going on all the time in all businesses. Yeah. So, yes? One is illegal, two is cheating. And um, American Constitution of uh, the Constitution of Men and Women says all men are created equal. The non athlete or the non celebrity is equal to the uh, celebrity. Although that's not true, because in the society it's, the celebrity is uh, regarded higher. But they should face the same judgment as the regular man in the society. Well, they should, they should go to jail. By going to jail, and he also banned from the, from the game, right? Yep. <coughs> we got two minutes. Any comments on the overall presentations? Both presentations. Any comments? Anything that surprised you? Besides the customer thing. I am surprised because in, in Venezuela, I, um, it's normal that the government is behind all these structures and all these buildings, stadiums, because it's the only one who has the money for do these constructions. But I'm shocked that here in America it's like that, because here the private parties have money too, so I was, yeah, I'm <coughs> shocked. I didn't know that. My own surprise is I listen to governments, governments to um, things, everything in, in majesty. <coughs> I don't like to find people uh, that are like ministry of this, that uh, can do things out of government and the United States. Because in my country, we have the federal government of Nigeria, we also have, um, we have boards. Um, so, government like the ministry, ministry of Education, Ministry of Sports, so uh, these people determine some things in sports. But here, you talk about the government, the government, the government. Yeah. It's, it's very involved. It's very involved. What, what we do in this country, sports, you got to remember, the same people who are behind, the money behind the politics in the United States is the same money behind sports in the United States. Same people. The same people who bring in his son owned a baseball team. His son's partner in owning a baseball team was a guy named Fred Malik, who worked for Richard Nixon who was one of Nixon's big guys, and when he tried to get the Washington franchise, he tried to bolster his chances by bringing in Colin Powell as a partner. So when you look at sports, and they brought me into, you know, I'm giving this here in the Bush Museum as opposed to school, because my expertise in journalism is the business, is the, is the politics of sports business. That's my expertise. There are other people who do sports business. I'm the only one who does the actual politics of sports business. And the way sports in this country runs is the same money people who are behind politics are behind sports. One last comment, anybody, yes? Yeah, I like the, uh, the system for the tax in the country, like you say about the system. And the sales tax? Sales tax. No, Seattle, 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 that's it, okay. Yeah, you know, but uh, to add the facilities about the taxes, it would be more. Because, like in my city in Jakarta, in Indonesia, we have uh, a good uh, facility in sport, but uh, the government just blocked this, not to add this. It's really. Uh, yeah, we our tax, I mean, you were in Florida, Florida is ridiculous with the taxes with sports, they hike the sales tax. The hotel rooms, the motel rooms, car rentals, restaurants. People, it's called the snowbird tax because they, they count on people from Canada, from Eastern Canada, from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New England states, Washington, Maryland, uh, into Ohio and, and Michigan to come down during the warm season, during the winter, and they plan to hit all those people up. Uh, at the hotel rooms and they tell the local people, and this is what I'll leave you with, you're not paying any tax increase. However, however, if you look at who rents the cars locally, there are a lot of people who locally rent cars. And the local, in San Antonio, when they rebuilt, when they built the new arena in San Antonio, they built, they said, well, we'll raise the hotel tax, we'll raise the uh, rent-a-car tax. 
uh, because it won't hurt anybody. And somebody did a statistical review of San Antonio, and they found out more local residents rented cars than out of towners because when you have an accident or if your car's in the shop for a few days, you need to get around, what do you do? You rent a car. So more locals rent cars in most cities, probably except Florida, than they do, um, than the out of towners do. And there are a lot of little white lies that are told that years later are exposed. And the people say, wow, if I only knew that then, and it was available. People don't read in this country. People have gotten smarter. They vote against it, but politicians have gotten smarter. They don't even put it up for a vote. Yes? Can I ask a question? What, what's your opinion about politicians owning clubs? Is it, is it good, based on your own personality, is it a good idea for politicians to own uh, Herb Cole, who's in the United States Senate, owns the Milwaukee Bucks in the NBA. Um, the, he could theoretically give favors to sports. Uh, but all the favors have been given. Yeah, it's just the business. I mean, George W. Bush was the governor of Texas, and he still had c controlling a piece of the Texas Rangers uh, at that point. I don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, you know, it's like what if a politician also owns a piece of a movie studio? You know, that's, you know, politician basic job, the real job of a politician should be to serve the people for his term or two terms and then go back home. That's what he should be doing, or she should be doing. But, you know, hey, Arnold Schwarzenegger is the governor of, of California. He was a heavy hitter in the, new, in the uh, movie industry. Ronald I mean, he's moved on. Ronald Reagan was the uh, president of the Screen Actors Guild for a while and, and an actor. And, uh, you know, George Murphy was a California politician. And Jesse the Body Ventura was a wrestler <laughs> turned governor of Minnesota. I mean, you know... He, why not? I mean, you know, people, some people have said, well, why don't you ever run for, because you, I know a lot about how things operate because of osmosis. Why don't you run this? I wouldn't run. I, I wouldn't want that job. I mean, you're never home. You're always out raising money and things like that. But, you know, I, I don't see anything wrong with a politician owning a piece of the team. I mean, as long as that politician is not basically, it is not writing laws that enables himself, but all the laws have been written for the most part. That's it. Thank you for being attentive.